Anunzio was left outside in winter, winter after winter after winter. He lived in a, um, a cardboard box, basically, for his shelter in a very small and, and filthy space. Uh, Magdalena lived at the same place as Anunzio, but she lived inside the barn, and we don't know why. Um, Anunzio was very, very skinny and, and extremely frightened of people. Um, when the humane police officers came in to this farm where he was, and they um, had to take all of the animals away because there were a lot of dead and dying animals all around. And so amongst them were Anunzio and Magdalena, who were two small pigs. When Anunzio first moved in with us, he screamed every time a human being was near. Has anybody ever heard a pig scream? A few of you, okay. A pig scream, for those of you who haven't heard it, is, louder, is a louder decibel than a jet engine. Okay. He was so frightened that even if we came inside the barn and weren't anywhere near him, um, you know, if he was in his own stall, we were in a separate section of the barn, maybe cleaning or something, he would be screaming. And he would continue to scream anytime anyone was at all in his proximity. This was getting tough. <laughs> Try holding on to volunteers when they can't clean a stall without a pig screaming the entire time. One day I was cleaning the stall next to Anunzio's, and as I was shoveling through the bedding, uh, I was singing. And believe me, I'm not a good singer. <laughs> Um, I have broken out into song on this very stage before, but not because I'm a good singer, just because I, I like music. Uh, so I was singing, and I realized that Anunzio wasn't screaming. So I poked my head around to his, to his area to see how he was doing, and he screamed again. So I went back to what I was doing, and as I started shoveling through the stall, I, I was singing again, and he stopped screaming looked again to make sure he was okay, and he, he started screaming again. Went back to singing, and he stopped screaming. So I did a test. I had a couple of different people come into the barn, first silently, and he would scream, and then start singing, and he would stop screaming. So we realized that for whatever reason, although Anunzio was quite frightened of human beings, he was, um, he was not frightened of us when we were singing. So the decree went out, and every volunteer at the sanctuary, at the, in those days we didn't have any, any staff, uh, it was just all volunteers, and uh, every volunteer at the sanctuary had to sing whenever they were at all in his proximity. Everyone had to sing. Doesn't matter if you're comfortable with it or not, that was the, the, the thing that we, we did. So this went on for over six months. Nobody was allowed any, anywhere nearby unless he was singing, or unless we were singing. And, uh, one day, I came around the barn, and he was outside um, sunning himself, and as I came around, I expected him to start screaming when I realized he was there, because I was, in fact, not singing. But instead of screaming, he looked at me with a little twinkle in his eye. And it was almost as if he was saying, well, hello, good morning to you. <laughs> you know, the friendliest greeting that I had ever experienced from Anunzio. Nunzi, we called him for short. Um, and so what that has to do with this conversation today is that there was a lot of conflict and a lot of drama with him screaming. And this, the part of the story that I don't tell people that often, but I will, I will divulge to you here today, was not only was he screaming, he was also biting. Okay, he was, <laughs> he bit a lot of people, Anunzio. He was really, so a lot of volunteers were actually so afraid of him that they wouldn't go into his area or take care of him. Um, so he was screaming, and, uh, and he was biting, and he stopped doing all of this when we started singing to him. So it got me thinking about conflict, and I'm going to share with you some of the lessons that I learned from Anunzio and some of the other animals today. Um, so I think it's very relevant to the work that we do. We humans are terrible at conflict. Has anyone ever noticed that? <laughs> so the animals have some things to teach us. First thing that I want to say, though, in order for us to be able to learn from the animals, is that they have voices, all of them. And in fact, I had a little recording in my, um, 
in, in this slide of Dao, this is a picture of Dao, who's one of my very best friends and um, certainly a major teacher in my life. And unfortunately, I'm not able to play his voice because of some technical challenges that I had um, with the slide. So um, Johnny said that he would do his voice, but he's now down there, so I'm going to have to do it for you. Uh, 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 approximation of what he said. His voice is a little bit lower than mine, but he gives you the idea. The reason that I say that is that it's, it's important. It's important for us to, to realize they have voices. All of them have voices, and even though you may not have understood what Dao was saying through me just now, <laughs> if you were observing him and paying close attention to him, you would be clear what he was saying to you. And that's important. Our job is to listen. This is the only social justice movement in history which is comprised of people who are not representative of the group whose rights are being sought. We are a bunch of humans looking for the liberation of other animals. So in order to do this ethically, in order to do our jobs to the best possible extent, we need to represent them the way that they want us to represent them, not the way that we want to do it. Okay? We have to be less human in this work. Okay. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We need to be less human. So I'm challenging you right now to listen. Another challenge is that you can't properly hear them anywhere but at a sanctuary. Okay. When a farmed animal in particular is at a farm where they know that their family members are being taken away and they know that they're ne not necessarily being treated as sacred, unique individual beings, they're going to be frightened. Okay. And when they're frightened, they're going to shut down. And this happens often. I mean, I'm sure many of you have been involved in rescuing farm animals before, right? Couple of you, raise your hands if you have, okay? Yeah, a bunch of you, good. When, when you're getting them from the place, wherever you're rescuing them from, you often see they have like a dull look in their eyes. Right? You see that you can't really, can't really tell what they're thinking or feeling. I personally believe they do that on purpose. It's kind of like if you're in a foreign country, right? And you assume that nobody's gonna speak your language, you're gonna stop trying to talk. I believe when they're frightened, they, and when they don't have people listening, they stop trying to talk. But when they're in a sanctuary setting, and we're paying attention to them, and we're listening to them, well then, they'll, then that veil gets lifted from their eyes, and you can see a lot more of what they're thinking and feeling. So you can't properly hear them anywhere but at a sanctuary. And the good news about this is that there are many, many, many more sanctuaries around than there were even just a few years ago. So you have a good opportunity. It needs to be a good sanctuary. It needs to be one where they listen to the animals, where they pay attention to them as individuals, where they respect them as individuals. When you find that, you'll find you'll be able to listen to them. So back to Anunzio. When all of this is, I know, he's adorable, isn't he? Is he not the cutest? Is that not the cutest face that you have ever seen? I miss this pig so much. Nunzio passed away a few years ago, and I just, uh, <laughs> can you just imagine him screaming and biting people and being a terror when he's so cute? It was really, um, it, was, it was an amazing experience. But what was more amazing was that through observation and through noticing that he stopped those behaviors when we were singing, we learned some very important things about ourselves. Okay. What happens to you when you're singing? Anybody? You feel good, okay. Anybody else? What happens to you when you're singing? You're careless, yeah. yeah. Often smiling, right? It's hard to be afraid of someone who's singing. And so I learned some really important things by observing Anunzio and learning what he, what he needed. And so then I started questioning to myself, okay, so what, what causes conflict in general? 
Because singing doesn't always work for everybody you have a conflict with. I've tried it a few times, and it turns out it makes them angrier when it's me singing. Uh, <laughs> so that's not always the answer for everyone. The question is, we need to understand what causes conflict so that we can understand how to, how to eliminate it. Okay. So the first one is disagreement. Okay. So Anuncio, is this Dao in this picture when he was a baby with Anuncio? Yeah, it is. Okay, so Dao, who I just showed you as an old man, this is him as a baby with a nuncio. Uh, so that's a nice coincidence. Um, so what, the first part is disagreement. Okay, so a nuncio disagreed that any humans should be around him. Okay, whatever happened to him in the past, whatever experiences that he had in his life, he did not feel that we needed to be in his presence. Okay, so he had a disagreement. He had a deep personal need as well. Okay, there was a lot of pain and terror that came up with the presence of human beings. So there was a deep personal need for safety. And in his mind, that safety could not occur when a human was around. So we had the disagreement and we had the deep personal need and then we had a lack of awareness. Okay? So Anunzio wasn't noticing those emotions rising up in him. And he wasn't choosing to say, okay, I'm going to see this emotion, I'm going to feel it, but I'm not going to act on it necessarily because it may not be the most effective thing and maybe I need to you know, do something else with these, with these humans to try to get along with them, right? That just wasn't, for Nunzio, that wasn't his thought process. For some animals, it is. Okay, so don't, don't think that there are necessarily simplified behaviors or thought patterns for, for all animals, because that's not at all what I'm saying. But Nunzio was a, he was a more simple guy. And so for him, that lack of awareness of his own emotion, he just acted on it. So that caused, that's what causes conflict for all of us, not just Nunzio. When we have a disagreement, we have a deep personal need that's gone unmet. And then we have a lack of awareness about that. Okay, so with Anunzio, I wasn't feeling that emotional about it. There were certainly some other people who he had scared. <laughs> Who, who were feeling more emotional about it, but for me, I wasn't. And that wasn't hitting one of my, of course, we all have deep issues, right? It wasn't hitting one of mine, so I was able to step back and pay attention and notice what was happening and fix it. But that's not usually the case. Usually, what is the case is that the emotions run deep on both sides, okay? So what I want to do is I want to talk with you a little bit about satya. This is Satya here, and as you can see in this photo, Satya is not very happy here. See how her ears are completely forward and her teeth are showing and her eyes are wide, and if this picture were a little bit clearer, you would see kind of a, an unhappy gleam in her eyes. Okay, because emotions were running very deep this day with Satya. So what happened with Satya was she had just been rescued, and I was introducing her to quicker, another horse. Okay. Horses often try, like humans, to create dominance immediately. So as soon as they meet another horse, they want to establish themselves. Not every horse, but a lot, of, a lot of them, just like a lot of humans and not every human, they try to establish dominance. And they try to get themselves into a situation where they can be top horse. Okay. So Satya was meeting quicker, and at that point, I had a real opportunity to, um, to, to observe a conflict unfolding. Okay. So what happened when she saw Quicker was even more extreme than this. And the reason that photo is not that clear is because she was in movement. Okay. She was a white hot ball of equine terror. She was a kicking, screaming, <laughs> biting, noisy, terrifying, flying around, thousand pound ball of terror, okay? And here I was trying to introduce her to my beloved friend Quicker, who's elderly and kind and gentle, and I had hoped that perhaps he would be so gentle that she wouldn't feel the need to try to dominate. What ended up happening instead is that Quicker got mad. So I had another thousand pound <laughs> equine terror, and they were running around the pasture, and they were kicking at each other, and they were biting towards each other, and things were happening so fast I couldn't even see what was happening, and there was no way that 
a mere human was going to be able to stop this situation from happening. Okay? When that happened, all these things came up in my body. My heart started pounding. I started feeling warm. I started feeling frightened. I felt tears coming. I was feeling my own terror. Okay, so now there's three of us, and we're all terrified <laughs> in this pasture. And I'm thinking to myself, if I don't get this situation under control, one of these horses could die. What am I going to do? So you can just imagine the terror that welled within. Okay. So what do we do when the emotions run deep like that? And it seems like it's gone so far, it's already out of control. Okay. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But before we do that, I want to examine this issue. Why? Why does this happen? Why, why did I get filled with terror? Okay, I didn't care which horse was dominant. If I had not been filled with terror, I would have been calmer and able to handle the situation better, right? Be able to think more clearly. So why, why was this? Okay. So the reason is because we are, we are animals. Okay. So we are designed to experience something once and learn, uh-oh, you know, we're like bunnies, okay? Oh, there's a lion that lives over there. I'm not gonna go over there again because there might be a lion, right? So we're just, our, our brains are wired to work that way in order to protect us. So if we're not paying attention to that feeling, we may not even realize it's happening, and then we're stuck in our own terror or deep emotions and we can't get out of them, okay? So Quicker showed me the way out. This is Quicker. He's a pretty cool old guy. So they're all running around, okay? And they are kicking and they are screaming and they are trying to bite each other and I didn't know what to do and Quicker stopped running. He stopped running and he was breathing really heavily. You ever see a horse breathing really heavily after they've been running, their nostrils are flaring with every breath? Okay. He just stopped running and stood there breathing, and his breathing started quieting down. Okay. And Satya stopped in her tracks as well. So now both of them are just standing there, and they're breathing heavily. Okay? Tensions are still running high. I mean, I, I swear I can hear everybody's heart pounding. Tensions are still very high. But Quicker stood, and he kept breathing until he started breathing more slowly and more deeply. Okay? He was looking away from her. And then he started, he put his head down as if he were going to graze. There was snow on the ground, so he couldn't graze. But he put his head down as if he were going to graze, and he started chewing. Okay. Now, that is the horse equivalent of a human being going to shake hands and smile, right? This is when we shake hands, it's the, it's the ancient symbol of, I don't have a weapon in my hands. Right? When a horse is grazing, they can't fight. So... Quicker was showing, I'm not going to fight you. I'm grazing. Okay. That ended up being the lesson of a lifetime that day. Okay. So he waited, and he breathed deeply and slowly, and Satya and I both slowed our own breath, too. And soon I realized all of our breath matched. Okay. My heart resumed its normal rhythm. Tension slipped away. I was curious about what was going to happen next. Well, Quicker took a step towards Satya, kept breathing, kept looking down and chewing. Here is the miracle. Satya took a, breath, a, a step towards Quicker, okay. still breathing calmly. She dug through the snow, and she started nibbling on some grass. So she was, uh, see, I don't have a weapon either. Okay. Quicker then came closer to her, and with each step, he, she matched the step. Step for step, they walked closer to each other until this happened. Okay. He put his nostril up against her nostril, and he breathed in her breath. And she just breathed out for him, and then she breathed in his breath. And they shared breath for a few minutes like that. It was almost as if Quicker was saying, we share the same air. We're one. We're one. We share the same air. We're united. He let out a quiet snort, and he walked away, and Satya walked calmly away, and they never fought again. Quicker showed me that compassion is the road through. 
He could have continued to live in his own terror and he could have continued to fight. But what he did instead was he stopped and he thought about it and he calmed himself down and he essentially put out his hand, okay? even more so by sharing his breath. In the animal rights world, we talk a lot about compassion for animals. But how often do we talk about compassion for each other? How often do we talk about compassion for the people who are doing the very things that we're trying to rescue the animals from? It's a lot harder, isn't it? The, the danger is, though, that when we don't show compassion for each other, or when we don't show compassion for any other human, okay, the animals are the end up, end up being the ones that suffer. Have any of you ever heard uh, an ancient Buddhist uh, saying that it, um, to be angry is like holding a hot coal in your hand to throw it at, some, at the person you're angry at? Have you ever heard that before? When we're working for animal rescue, that hot coal in our hands, which is our anger, when we throw it, it burns all of the animals that we're trying to rescue, okay? It just makes them go up in flames. I've seen this happen too many times. I have, I, I'll tell you about one situation with a rescue. Uh, it was last year, we rescued almost 1,200 chickens. Um, there was a gentleman who was going to give them away. Um, he was on a corner in Philadelphia, and he had thought he was going to raise these chickens on an abandoned lot and make some money with a quick turn around, selling them quickly to slaughter, but then he quickly realized that he couldn't take care of them. So he announced that he was going to give birds away, and um, we heard about it at Indraloka at the same time that a number of other animal rights rescuers um, heard about it. Animal rights activists really heard about it. Um, the police also heard about it, and so the police showed up, and then the humane police showed up, and then there are all these animal rights activists, and there are people from Indraloka, and everybody's there wanting to rescue these more than a thousand birds. Okay. What ended up happening is one of the activists became so fearful, understandably fearful of the police, and fearful that they would decide to kill the birds instead of allow them to be saved, that she began arguing with them and fighting with them about it. Okay. Some of the other activists took some of the birds and they thought they would be able to steal them and run away with them, but the police caught them. Okay, so already now the police are, are, are questioning us, right? And this young woman starts arguing with them, and I understand where she's coming from. As she's arguing with the police, she steps on one of the birds and kills the bird. Okay, because she's so focused on her argument. Now, this situation devastated this poor young woman. It devastated her. When we allow our anger to get out of control and we start throwing those hot stones, it's the animals that we burn up. We cannot afford to do it. We cannot, they cannot afford for us to do it. Giving in to our every emotion is an indulgence that we cannot afford to do. Okay. Not only can compassion save us from ourselves, it's the only thing that's going to save the other animals from us. Without compassion for all, we fail all. Okay, it may seem like an impossible to attain dream, this idea of compassion for all. So I want to share with you some words from a very wise woman. Her name is Karen Maison Miller. Uh, she's a Zen Buddhist teacher and a writer. She says, compassion isn't an unattainable ideal. It's simply a turn away from the isolation and ego toward the, and toward the world we create, inhabit, and share. Okay. From this perspective, every single cry fills my entire universe. Every single problem is my problem. Every wound is mine to heal, okay. especially those of my foes. Okay. Sure, suffering can divide us into the perpetrator and the victim, the powerful and the powerless, but it can also awaken and unite us. In fact, it must. I'm going to share with you 
Seven daily practices to treat others like animals. Okay. These are practices that I've learned from observing the animals, and I'm going to share some of those stories with you now. There are also some practices that I've learned from observing some very wise humans who are also animals. You've got to be careful which humans you learn from, but there are a few <laughs> out there that you can. Okay. So we're going to go through each one of these, but quickly, we're going to start with a morning ritual. Now, this doesn't look like steps for conflict resolution, does it? And that's because the conflict resolution has to stop, start a lot before the conflict does. Okay? We need to become people that are able to act strategically. And that means sometimes that we need to train ourselves to be able to have that compassion on a regular basis. And I'm going to talk some more about that in a second. Okay? Start with a morning ritual every single morning of gratitude journaling. And I'll explain to you why all of this matters. Okay. And we're going to work on seeing our own selves as animals okay, and having that compassion for our own selves that we have for other animals. Okay. We're going to then work on visualizing the end of suffering, okay. not just for ourselves and for the animals, but for other humans as well. We're going to choose to respond instead of react. We're going to shine and we'll go to an evening practice. So, you don't expect to be the world's best violinist the first time you pick up a violin, correct? You don't expect to be an Olympic athlete the first time you start a new sport, right? So compassion is a muscle, and it needs to be exercised. And for those of us in this room, we happen to be very good already, kind of born with the innate skill of having compassion for other animals, but we rarely have compassion for other humans. And we need to exercise that muscle for everyone. Okay. So these seven daily practices are the practices that are going to help you with that exercise. We're going to st start first by talking about the gratitude journaling. Okay, this is Jeremiah Jones. What you see here is blood coming out of his nose and us feeding him with a syringe. Okay. The reason that you're seeing that is because Jeremiah Jones had been left outside in the cold during a terrible, one of the worst winters we'd ever had. Okay. He was with his brother and his brother died. He was two weeks next to his brother's body. And he became so weak himself with pneumonia because of the cold that he actually couldn't stand. So he was laying next to his dead brother's body on the frozen mud for so long that he developed wounds on his legs. He was, not able to, he was not able to move. He was not able to stand up. And because he hadn't been fed for so long, he was almost starved to death by the time we got him. So that he wasn't even able to take in any solid food. His body wouldn't have been able to process it. So we had to very, very slowly feed him with a syringe, just little bits of liquid sustenance at a time. And the reason the blood is coming out of his nose is because that's, that pneumonia had gotten so bad out there in that cold that he lost the lining of his airways. And so with every breath, he spewed blood because his airways had no lining. What does Jeremiah Jones have to do with gratitude? Well, absolutely everything. This guy is incredible. Okay, look at the look in his eyes. And this is, this is, within days of being rescued. And if you see that look in his eye, do you see that gleam? He's grateful. The minute that we took him out of the humane police officer's vehicle, we had to, we were, it was icy and it was difficult to get him into the barn, so we ended up putting him into a wheelbarrow to make sure we wouldn't drop him, bring him into the barn, and we set him down in a bed that we had set up with lots and lots of hay and heat lamps and blankets and a little pillow for his head. And he just made one, he was so weak, he could barely open his eyes, but he just, he opened one eye a little bit and he said, oh, it was gratitude, it was thank you. Even in that moment, he thanked us. And he continued to do that every single day. And today, years afterwards, when he's a strong and healthy pig and he runs free, he lives every second of his life in gratitude, in deep, deep Gratitude, he has never forgotten. And that's a lesson all of us can learn. So, what you want to do is to get yourself a journal, okay? Because gratitude is another muscle that we need to develop. We need to rewire our brains. Humans have 
brains that are more likely to remember something bad than something good. And the reason for that, again, is just because we're animals. It's the same situation with the bunny and the lion, right? We're going to remember the things that we have to remember to stay alive. But guess what? We as humans don't, don't necessarily, we're not necessarily facing life and death with everything that we have a bad experience with. But somehow we've evolved in such a way, developed in such a way, that our brains are hardwired to remember the bad. So you're going to work on hardwiring your brain for the good. And this is, by the way, I don't mean just you. This is something I'm working on too. Um, so we want to dedicate a journal, okay? Make it a beautiful journal. Make it something that you really love. Decorate it with dried flowers or draw on it or do something that, you, 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 that makes you really love this journal. Get yourself a pen that you love and a color that you love that writes smoothly that you like, okay? And before getting out of bed every single morning, before even getting out of bed, list five things for which you're grateful. Five things. When I started this practice, I was at a very low point in my life. I, early on, when I had just started the sanctuary, things were hard. Things were so hard, and I was all by myself, with a whole lot of animals in the mountains of Pennsylvania in the middle of winter. I don't know what I was thinking. It was so hard, and it was hard for me to even remember something to be grateful for. I literally had to start with, I'm grateful I have this journal. I'm grateful I know how to write. I'm grateful I have clean water to drink that's sitting next to this journal. You know, this kind of thing, really the basic, basic stuff. There's something that, that all of us have to be grateful for. Okay, so even if it has to be, and even if you have to repeat the same things every day for a while, that's okay. But do it. Do it, because in a few weeks, you're going to realize you have a million things to be grateful for. You won't be able to stop at five. It changes the way that we look at things. It helps us to start remembering the good stuff. And then we can be joyous like Jeremiah. Isn't he, isn't he beautiful and joyous in that picture? Okay. So I've never known anyone who is better at cultivating empathy than Penny. This is Penny. And Penny was one of my best friends and one of my greatest teachers. And Penny used to roam free on sanctuary grounds. Um, so each day, she would um, ask us to be let out of the cow pasture. And so we'd open the gate and let her out of the cow pasture. And she'd wander around the sanctuary. And she would find someone who needed her. Okay? That someone could be a chicken. That someone could be a human. That someone could be another cow. That someone could be a goat. Didn't matter to her. She would find someone who needed her, and she would do something to, to comfort them, okay? Sometimes she would just lay down next to them. Sometimes she would, you know, push something that they liked near them. Sometimes she would just nuzzle and groom them, okay? Often with humans, she would place her muzzle right on your heart. And sometimes she would even cry. So Penny was the best the best person at compassion that I've ever, ever seen. And I would tell you stories about her for hours, and hours and hours and hours, but I'm supposed to not talk to you all night? <laughs> it's one of the silly agreements. Um, <laughs> so, what I want to tell you about Penny is that when you're done with your grat gratitude journaling and begin your day, there's an opportunity to be like Penny, okay? So whether you're, you're, whatever you're doing to begin your day, you're checking your emails, you're running errands, you're driving to work, you're feeding animals, you're getting ready for work, okay? What, whatever it might be, okay? Go, go, doing errands, going to the post office, okay? Pick someone, okay? Pick someone that you come across, okay? Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a grocery clerk, Okay, maybe it's um, the mail carrier. Maybe it's someone that you pass every day on your commute. Okay, pick someone. And I want you to start imagining their suffering. We don't know their stories, right? And with humans, it's a little difficult to get to that story. Now, I don't know how Penny would know. She would just always know. But you can imagine what their story is because everybody has one. Everybody's suffering, okay? All of us as humans, that's the nature of it, right? It doesn't mean that we're only and always suffering, but there is some suffering in all of us. Everybody has a story. Okay. So be like Penny and pick someone and imagine their story and start cultivating your compassion for them. Okay? It could be just anything. It could be your thoughts and just sending them good thoughts. It could be an extra smile for them. 
Right? It could be just a moment of kindness in their day. Look for opportunities to cultivate that. Okay. Consider when you felt something similar. Okay, so whatever their suffering is that you're imagining may not be the actual story, okay, but it is a story and you're cultivating that suffering, that compassion, and you're thinking about a time that you too have suffered in a similar way. And the reason that you're doing that is, again, because we want to unite, okay? We want to use our compassion to unite ourselves and to help lift each other up like Penny did. Notice Penny didn't get depressed, okay? She didn't get down from everybody else's suffering, but what she would do is she would let them know she was there with them and look for them together to raise themselves up. After seeing the other as an animal, it's time to turn our, turn our attention inward, okay? We're gonna see ourselves as animals now, too. And this is Sherman. Sherman was an absolutely delightful, wonderful rooster. Absolutely a joy to be around. He would eat out of your hands, he would cuddle with you, he would just, he was a wonderful rooster, unless you were a bird. Okay. Okay, so, and I've just gotten the sign that I need to move a little bit faster, but unless you were a bird. And so what would happen to Sherman with, with other birds is that he would fight with them, okay? He would fight terribly and terribly with them, and it was dangerous. It got to a point where we actually had to keep Sherman separated from other birds, and so he wasn't getting outside to wander around as freely because he always had to be watched when he was wandering around. So one summer we had a gentleman who had some de developmental differences who came to volunteer with us, and he had an aide that came along with him. And his task was to have simple jobs, brush an animal, clean a stall, fill a water bucket, sweep a barn, simple jobs. And the aide would, would coach him along. And sometimes this boy, his name was Charlie, and sometimes he would get frustrated. And one of his main issues was rage. He didn't know how to control it. When he would become frustrated, he would just get angrier and angrier and angrier, and he was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was becoming a problem, okay? So even when the aide was being very gentle with him, it would frustrate him that he wasn't understanding, and he would get angry. So one day, we asked Charlie to watch Sherman while he was outside and keep him away from other birds so that he wouldn't fight with other birds. And it turned out beautifully. Charlie did great at that job, Sherman did great, he was able to be outside longer with the other birds. So we started doing this over and over again. And what we found is that when Charlie would start to become frustrated with his aid, Sherman would start walking over closer to him. And as Sherman would walk over closer to Charlie, Charlie would relax. Okay. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't be as angry, he wouldn't be as frustrated. Something about Sherman just comforted him. What we found then was while, while Charlie was out watching Sherman, if Sherman started to puff up and look like he was about to start a fight with another bird, Charlie would simply go near him, hug him, talk to him. Soon it was even just standing near him. And Sherman would calm his feathers back down, and he'd stop going into that space. And so both Charlie and Sherman helped each other notice when those emotions were coming up. And by helping to notice when those emotions were coming up, they were able to not lose control, not become so rageful. And as a result, Sherman, who in the, in the beginning of his life had very limited access to outdoor time and other birds because of his temper, ended up being a bird who could be outside all the time and didn't fight. There were occasional spring rooster fights, but he wasn't nearly the same bird that he had ever been before. So, as you're going through your day, notice a moment when you feel something, when you feel a strong emotion, be it sadness, be it pain, be it anger, be it fear. Okay. And ask yourself, when has an animal you loved felt something similar? Because okay. I'm guessing you're like me. It's really easy to have compassion for a squirrel in a tree, or a dog walking down the road, or a cow in a pasture, but it's harder to have compassion for ourselves and for other humans, okay? So when you think about, when you notice that feeling coming up and you ask, when has an animal you loved felt that way? And how are these feelings experienced? Okay, by myself, by other humans. I'm gonna go a little, I'm gonna go a little into our Q&A time, okay? Because I wanna make these couple of points. Um, 
you know, this is going to help us start to, by, by thinking about people and thinking about our animals and the similarities between them, they're going to help us to see humans like animals. Okay, this is Duncan and Nugget. And Duncan and Nugget are so close to each other and have so much, so much connection to each other that literally we have to, every, every six months or so we have to trim their tusks or they get really, really long and they can hurt each other on them because they get pointy. So we have to trim their tusks. And it doesn't hurt them, but you have to hold them still to do it. And when you hold a prey animal still, it's super scary. And get, by the way, we are predators. Even if we are their family members, we're still predators and it's still gonna bring up those instincts. So they scream the whole time you're trimming their tusks. And every time you're trimming one of their tusks, the other one stands right next to them and screams alongside them. <laughs> Which is really very, very sweet. Um, although loud and not necessarily the funnest job to do. Uh, <laughs> but if you think again of that animal that you loved, Okay, and her or his suffering. Okay. How would you have liked to help them? So just like Duncan and Nugget do for each other. Okay, they want to help each other get through that. How is the human that I focused on this morning, how are they similar to that other animal? Okay, so again, we've imagined their story, we've imagined their suffering. We're understanding now how Duncan might have something in common with perhaps the postal clerk that I thought was rude to me, or whatever. Envision helping them in the way that you would help the other animals. So for me, I comfort them. That's my job when we're doing the tusk trimming is I, I sing in their ears. It hears me with the singing again, right? Uh, <laughs> I sing in their ears, and it often calms both Duncan and Nugget down. Um, so whatever it is that you can do to visualize yourself helping that other person, it may not be singing. Um, this is Bo, and Bo teaches us an important lesson too, okay? And that lesson is that kindness ripples outward. And so does anger and hatred. So the question is, which will we choose? This is Mazzy. His full name, his full Hebrew name is Mazor Nur Tamid. Okay, healing balm of eternal light. And the reason that we named him this is that when we got him, he had had a spinal crush injury that hadn't been treated. And so he was completely paralyzed on his back end. He couldn't even go to the bathroom on his own. Despite everything that Mazzy had been through, he just shines all the time. He has this light coming from him. He has this joy within him. And he teaches us that no matter what happens, it's an opportunity to shine that it is impossible to not smile around this pig. Okay. Impossible. So Mazzy is a great example. Whenever you're thinking of yourself feeling maybe a little dark, maybe you're like bringing some kind of negative energy to the people around you, think about Mazzy or somebody else that you love. Think about the way that they shine. Okay. So just as we started our day with gratitude, we're going to end our day with gratitude, okay? But first, we're going to reflect, okay? So what went well? When was I kind to someone? When did I notice an emotion and, and respond instead of react, okay? So I didn't throw that hot stone that I wanted to throw. What, and then what could I have done better? Because there's always ways that we could do better. It's not a beat yourself up kind of thing. It's a let me learn from this kind of thing. So I actually like to visualize doing it better to help me kind of be prepared for the next time through. And then go back to that gratitude journal. Last thing before you go to sleep. Last, last, last thing before you go to sleep. Five more things you're grateful for. I'd like to close with more wise words from Karen Maison Miller. I'm going to read this to you because I want to get it right. I know the fear and pain. I listen to the cries which echo my own. But what I see in this goes beyond me alone. What I see is you, and you, and you. An infinite whole that conveys the magnitude of the suffering, the empathy required of us, and the urgent need for each of us to wake up and begin to do good. When I can forget myself even for a moment, the barrier between us dissolves, and then my own eyes and my own arms reach out to touch. So our responsibility as activists for the other animals is to act as they would, to learn from them, and to represent them well. In their eyes, 
We are our highest selves. Our hearts in our hands as we rush to save them, they must do our best and strongest work. So for them, I ask you, forget yourself. Even for a moment, remember that this infinite world of suffering requires one thing and one thing alone, compassion for all. With your heart and eyes and hands open, reach out in compassion. This is the only way that we can heal this broken world.